All right, so I think I need to begin because I'm short of time as it is, and now we're nine minutes late. So, um, yeah, so I'm going to talk about Lisp. Uh, first of all, I did this talk in January at LinuxConf AU in New Zealand. Uh, have any of you, s how many of you have seen the video of that on YouTube? All right, so not too many. That's good. All right, so then I'll do kind of the same talk uh, because uh, that time I only managed to do like half the talk, so I could do the second half now. But okay, we'll we'll do the same one. Uh, that's good. Um, so my name is Christopher Grenland. I work for SUSE. Um, SUSE is a German sort of company. It's actually owned by a Swedish company now called EQT. Um, since sometime in March. So it's kind of a Swedish company. So you know, if you want to work for open source, you want to work for a Swedish company. You want to do like actual open source. Like yeah, there's one. There's one company doing that. Uh, and I work from home, um, which is great. I also do a podcast called Quad Snack. If you've heard that one, uh, it's in Swedish. Uh, but I'm going to do the talk in English because I think there might be some English speakers. Um, so this talk is started with me reading this paper, which is the kind of the original Lisp paper. So there are some uh, earlier ones, um, there are publications, but this is like the first like real write-up of, of what Lisp is. And uh, yeah, it's the part one, but there's no part two. Um, the he never wrote the second part. Um, and uh, yeah, I call it like Let's Lisp like it's 1959, but actually I saw that the paper was written in 1960, so uh, I was off by one year, but it's, it's close enough. I thought it was like exactly 60 years ago, but it's not, not, uh, not exactly. Um, and uh, the abstract of this talk says that uh, I'm going to implement a Lisp. And I do have that talk in the talk. Like last time I did this talk, I never even got to that part. Uh, I'll see. If I go a bit faster, maybe I'll actually get to the part where we actually write Lisp implementation. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I started looking at the history of Lisp, and I got too fascinated. So the talk is almost all about that. Um, so we're going to start in around 1955. Uh, so in 1955, uh, Marvin Minsky and John McCarthy, who were like the founders of AI, started a separate lab at MIT called the, the AI Lab. And uh, John McCarthy is the, the person who coined the term artificial intelligence. So he was the one who came up with the idea. Um, and their background was mainly math. So they came from the MIT math department and in logic. So uh, formal logic. And so their, their vision of AI or how computers work were also based on math and logic. So they thought, you know, like, oh, if, an, if a computer is going to work like a human, the computer is going to be very logical because humans are extremely logical because that's how they were. And uh, yeah, they eventually started figuring out, like, oh, maybe, maybe it's not true. Um, so this is a picture of John McCarthy f much later. Uh, this is when he was playing chess against a team in the uh, Soviet Union, like computer chess, in 1967. And the Soviet team won 3-1, to one, um, which may be why generally we haven't heard about this uh, that much, because in, in like uh, Western European society, you know, a Soviet win was not a, not a good thing. Uh, actually, John McCarthy's parents were both communists, and he spoke fluent Russian. Um, and he got a lot of his passion for math and logic from reading Russian language uh, books on math. Uh, so that's kind of an interesting, because all of the development of, of Lisp and computers in general are like based in Second World War and then in the Cold War afterwards. So all of this is happening during the Cold War. And actually, one of the people who are like mainly involved in the American side are actually can talk fluent Russian to the people who are doing computer development on the other side. So I thought that was kind of an interesting uh, thing. Um, but yeah, so the, the idea that they had at the MIT level was to make uh, computers uh, work like uh, people. So like you would have a computer that actually thinks like a human being. Um, and the thing is, they at the time, they thought that this is like really close. Like they, they already had these incredibly advanced computers that can basically do anything. It's just around the corner that they're actually going to start thinking for themselves. And it's just like kind of used need to figure out a few small things, and we're, and we're going to have it. Uh, turns out it's actually really dif difficult to make computers think. Uh, <laughs> and 
this is actually the title of a paper that John McCarthy published in 2006. Uh, I, I actually think that you, you could say human level AI, AI is harder than it seems in 2019 as well. Uh, I think there's like a second renaissance in like AI machine learning and it's like, oh, it's gonna be great. Yeah, I'm, I'm not that impressed, but you know, we can discuss that uh, later. I'm not gonna go into that. Um, so in uh, 19 1956, um, there was a program developed where, so at this time, all of the computer programs, uh, computer programming languages were machine level languages, like assembly languages, uh, specific to particular computers. Uh, and so in 1956, IPL2 was developed, which was the first list processing language, uh, but it was still uh, an assembly language. Um, in 1957, however, uh, Fortran was released, uh, and Fortran was the first high-level language. So this is the first programming language that you could program different machines with. So previously, every language was an assembly language specific to a particular architecture, and because computers were still new, they didn't have, like, processes standards or like instruction set standards. So every computer was completely different and every computer had to be programmed completely differently. So Fortran was a huge development. And these were kind of the two foundational ideas that fed into Lisp. So John McCarthy was really impressed with IPL and the ability to use lists to represent uh, ideas or sentences of thoughts and process on those. And then he was really impressed by Fortran and having like a higher level language that you could use across multiple machines. So in 1958, he started work on, on Lisp, uh, which brings us then to 1959. Uh, so at the uh, AI lab, uh, they managed to get hold of a computer, which is uh, kind of a another interesting idea. It's like computers were actually very rare at the time. And uh, it took a few years for the, the AI lab uh, devoted to making computers think, to actually get a computer. But uh, at this time, they managed to get one. Uh, they had an IBM 704, uh, and I think this is an IBM 704 that you can see uh, in the picture. And it consists of a bunch of uh, parts that are big as big as fridges. Um, the, the one in the front is the punch card reader. So that's where you feed the program into the computer and you use it, do it using punch cards, which are a piece of paper with holes punched out of them, representing uh, ones and zeros. Um, and so you feed those one by one into the punch card reader, and then the punch card reader feeds that into the processor, which is another one of these big machines that has a lot of blinking lights showing the state of the registers and so on. And then, if you're lucky, the processor then produces some output to the printer, which prints that on a piece of paper, and then you can look at the paper and get like, okay, my, my program worked. Um, and so I have this wonderful quote that I want to read. Uh, that I actually I should have written down where I got the quote, but uh <laughs> if you Google it, you'll find it. Um, it may be hard to visualize a 704 or to comp comprehend the place it held in the public imagination as the type specimen of what a computer was. A collection of mysterious hulking gray cabinets approachable only through the intercession of the operator. In the specially built computer room, the operator set switches, pushed buttons, and examined panels of flashing lights, while assistants attended various whirring, clanking, and chattering devices, rushing to and from with stacks of cryptically printed paper, decks of weirdly punched cards, and reels of brown ribbon, all to the background hum of the machine. Add a little incense and a few candles, and you could be forgiven for thinking these were the rites of some oracle shrine. So it's very fascinating and very mysterious to people in general, like computers, uh, how do they work. Um, I have a video that I can't show you because I'm not on the internet, but you can uh, see the link. Uh, all these slides are going to be online later if you want to find this stuff. Um, but that's not of a 704, that's of a 1401, which is the computer that they have at the uh, Computer History Lab in uh, uh, California which is actually working today. So if you ever go to California, I would recommend, I think it's in San Francisco or uh, yeah, the Bay Area. Um, if you ever go there, I would love to go there and you can actually see one of these uh, working. And I was told when I did this talk last time uh, from someone who had been there that uh, Steve, uh, what is his name? Uh, anyway, uh, the space war guy, invented the first computer game. He's going to show up later. Anyway, he's there in the lab, if you're lucky, and will show you 
how to use the computer. So that's pretty awesome. Um, but yeah, I started looking into like the early computers ar on, uh, around Lisp and, uh, at the time, which is like right at the start of computers in general. And that got me looking into kind of the early history of computers uh, overall. And so that, br of course, brings me to ENIAC, which is kind of the first computer. Turns out, actually not. So during, uh, before we had computers as machines, uh, there were computers as people. So uh, the term computer was actually kind of a job that you would have. Uh, you would be the computer that would actually do the job of doing all the calculations for solving a problem. Uh, and during the war, basically all of the computers were women. Uh, so all of the men were out dying in war, and all the women were doing computations. And what we're doing was calculating missile trajectories. Uh, so uh, the military needed to know, like, when we shoot a missile at the enemy, where is it going to land? And that's a lot of ca complicated calculations, and they assigned those tasks to uh, big rooms of full of women doing all these calculations by hand. Uh, at the end of the war, they were starting to develop computers, like machine computers, they could do these calculations. Uh, so the first computers were dedicated to calculating missile trajectories. That was kind of the idea. Uh, and so ENIAC was built for that purpose. And when they built the ENIAC, they needed someone to actually set the program uh, and do the programming. Uh, and this was before programming was even a term. Uh, and so they had these human computers, uh, and of course, they then picked some of the hum human computers and said, okay, now your job is to tell the machine computer what to do. And so these were the first programmers. Um, and uh, it was a team led by a woman called Jean Jennings uh, that uh, programmed the ENIAC. There were six women. Um, and yeah, that's her in the picture. I think that's her on the left. And then there's Fran Bylas on the right. And uh, the history of actually digging up this is uh, fascinating. I'm not going to go into that too much, but there's a project called the ENIAC Programmers, and I think it's at eniacprogrammers.org, uh, where you can uh, read about that. So in the 90s, uh, there was a woman who started looking into this and got fascinated with finding out that, oh, actually, there were all the early programmers were women. Uh, this is like it was history that no one had talked about. And she actually managed to find some of them and interview them. And so she has uh, this documentary where you can see the interviews uh, with them. Uh, but yeah, I have another quote <laughs> that I read, which I think illustrates kind of the, the problem is that because they were women, it was assumed that the work they did must not have been very difficult. So at the time, everyone was very impressed by the big machines making noise and blinking lights, and no one noticed the people actually working machines. Uh, they were kind of invisible. <coughs> uh, so but I think as programmers it's or as developers, it's kind of up to us to uh, rediscover and honor the history of programming. And so in Sweden, we actually have a similar history. Um, the first computers in Sweden were built in the 50s. Uh, they were called Bark and Besk. Um, <laughs> and uh, one of the people working on those computers were a woman called Elsa Karin Boestad Nilsson. Uh, and she is actually still around and has done some interviews uh, lately, so you can find information about her and the work she did. Um, but I thought that was uh, pretty cool. Uh, I'm not going to go into her as either, but yeah, you can find more about her online. Uh, when I was looking into this, uh, I also came across uh, this woman, which I used it's not really related to Lisp or uh, history of uh, computers there, but she's fascinating <laughs> anyway. <laughs> um, so uh, Vera Watson was the wife of John McCarthy. Uh, she was of Chinese-Russian descent, so she was a Russian speaker who grew up in China and uh, of, for reasons, uh, had to move to the U.S. when she was a child. Uh, but she spoke Russian, and so she was hired by IBM as a translator because they wanted to build machines that could translate Russian into English, for obvious reasons. Um, but she turned out to be a really good programmer, and so she became a programmer uh, at IBM. And later, she worked on, um, among other things, she worked on the IBM System R, which was the first SQL database, uh, or the first computer, including a SQL database. Uh, so she had a lot of, uh, she was a programmer herself, and she had a lot of influence in kind of the history of programming. Um, but one fascinating thing about her is that she was also a mountain climber. And not just a mountain climber, but <laughs> kind of 
one of the top mountain climbers of all of history. Uh, so I, I wanted to go into that uh, because she was the first woman to ascend uh, Aquanagua, which is the highest mountain in the southern and western hemispheres. Um, so it's in the Andes. And um, she was also part of the American Women's Himalayan Expedition to climb Annapurna 1, which is this mountain. And it's one of the top 10 mountains in the world. So it's uh, one of the mountains that are above 8,000 meters in height. Uh, and it's so what I found out is that it's one of the most deadly mountains in the world as well. And sadly, uh, as you can see on her life span, the expedition was in 1978. She and one other member of the expedition uh, died doing this climb. So uh, one really cool thing that happened when I did this talk in New Zealand, uh, after that I traveled around for a bit and I came across this bookstore in uh, Wamura, I think it's called, on the east coast of the South Island. And I just happened to go in and I found this book, which was about the expedition. And so I said, like, oh, that's cool. And it, it had, it was signed by the author, so I was like, oh, that's, that's really awesome. It had a dedication to Vera Watson. And so I said, oh, I'm going to buy this book. So I went to the guy who had the store, and I said, like, oh, I want to buy this book. And he's like, oh, do you know I knew them? And I was like, what? So actually he uh, knew the author of the book, who was the leader of the expedition to Annapurna 1. And when she came to New Zealand to climb mountains in New Zealand, he would drive her around to uh, the mountains. So I thought that was <laughs> really pretty awesome. Um, so yeah. Uh, the final person I want to highlight that's kind of gets forgotten in the history of Lisp is uh, Dr. Phyllis Fox. So this is the front page of the first manual for Lisp, which was written in 1960. So this is kind of pre-published Lisp. So there's kind of the first real manual, which is the Lisp 1.5 manual, which was with the version of Lisp that other people can use. This was kind of the internal documentation they used for Lisp, the first version of Lisp that they had that kind of worked, but they hadn't like published it outside the AI lab. Uh, and on that page, you can see everyone who's in the team at the time. So you have John McCarthy, who was the professor and the founder of the MIT a a lab, and the kind of the driver of the LISP project. He, he was the one who came up with it. Uh, then there's a bunch of names, and then there's P. Fox. Uh, P. Fox is Phyllis Fox, who uh, started as a human computer on the UNIVAC, together with Gene Jennings from the ENIAC. Um, so she was, during the war and so on, she was a human computer. Um, she later worked on a differential an uh, analyzer, which was kind of like a pre-computer, uh, a cal big calculator, you could say. And then in 1949, she worked with the Whirlwind team, which is, Whirlwind was another early computer, uh, writing software for the Whirlwind. And later than that, she wrote a language called Dynamo, which was the first simulation language. And uh, she wrote the first Lisp manual. So she's her credits in the manual are for the manual and a little bit of work on the side, but uh, it's actually, so I, when I did this talk the first time, I said like, oh, it's a li isn't it a little bit fishy that you have uh, John McCarthy who's the prof professor who came up with the idea, but he doesn't have any experience with actually with computers. He just got his first IBM 704. Uh, then you have a bunch of students. Th that's the, the other people here. And then you have this person who's written not only multiple programming languages, but actually worked as a human computer uh, worked on one of the first computers, and then uh, helped build another computer. And now she is credited by just writing the manual. I said, like, ah, this is fishy. Um, thanks to the wonders of YouTube comments, uh, I got this comment. Uh, so I don't know if you can read that. Um, but on, when on the video of that talk, uh, I got this comment that said, like, oh, yeah, I, I agree that making the record clear on women in, in the history of computing is great. Uh, but I didn't appreciate what was close to false accusations in the talk, so uh, regarding the the involvement of Phyllis Fox. Um, if you want to see the real story, look at this link. And so I was really happy about that because I hadn't found that, so that I actually did. And there's some really great stuff there. But yeah, they used to set the record straight. Uh, she herself doesn't think that she was set aside in the Lisp development, and she actually did write the manual, and that was like her involvement. Uh, but um, yeah, she, so in the interview she said, uh, I would ask questions from Minsky and McCarthy and I got it done. 
uh, the manual that is. Uh, I guess essentially I'm a documenter. If you're looking for it, that's what I am, uh, which I think is underselling, but I'll go into that. So <laughs> I couldn't resist. So this is from the interview uh, with uh, Phyllis Fox. Uh, it's a really great, really long. She was involved in a lot of cool stuff. Uh, but in, in this part, she talks about how she lost her job at General Electric working on the differential analyzer. Um, so she said, uh, one day the door opened and some high-powered person came in with three men. They were probably all in suits and they looked at the analyzer. I was used to visitors, so I showed them everything. Uh, towards the end of the visit, the big boss who was there with them introduced us and said, now these three gentlemen are going to work here and run this machine and you will work for them. Uh, this is over over in the pattern for many of women even now. Um, and sh at the time she thought, like, well, it's true, I'm not an engineer. And they had been in the war and they were engineers. Um, but I didn't want to do that, so I left and said, I, I need to get an engineering degree. Um, but yeah, so then the question says, so these three people were basically doing the things that you had been doing on your own before. And she answered, I guess so, I probably left them to it after a while. But yeah, I mean, it wasn't difficult. <laughs> so she's, she's pretty, pretty awesome. So I have another, <laughs> another quote I can't resist. Um, so here she's talking about her work on the whirlwind. And uh, uh, see if I can find the part I want to read. Uh, yes. Uh, you see, the computer was still being built. So I spent the bulk of the year busy with all this other stuff doing a computer program in machine language for the whirlwind. And every now and then, I would see that I needed a certain instruction that they hadn't yet included in whirlwind's commands. And I would tell the whirlwind engineers about it. I had all the timing diagrams showing the path and timing of the electric pulses, so I knew how the machine worked and what was feasible. For example, I found that it would be useful to have an instruction that would add one to the current address, AO, I called it. It was essentially a loop mechanism that I was inventing. So they changed some of the instruction set in whirlwind, and I think they found it useful to have someone actually writing a program for it. So, so if you think programming is difficult now, imagine programming a computer that doesn't exist, where you go like, oh, now I need this instruction. Let me tell the computer builders about it. And like, yeah, but I, I had all the timing diagrams, so I knew it was possible. Like, uh, yeah. <laughs> anyway, awesome person. Go read the full interview. It's pretty cool. Um, so back to Lisp. Uh, this is a quote by John McCarthy from another of his papers. Um, Representing sentences by list structures seemed appropriate. It still is. And the list processing language also seemed appropriate for programming the operations d involved in deduction, and still is. So he hasn't given up on Lisp, uh, and in fact, he knows what the right method is. And so I've seen this um, this uh, meme before. With this is John McCarthy, and then programming you're doing completely wrong. And I didn't really know like why why this attitude. But now that I actually read his papers, it's uh, totally accurate. This is his attitude. It's lovely. Um, so he he doesn't just think that you're doing it wrong. He actually thinks Alan Turing was doing it wrong, and that's why he was inventing Lisp. Um, so Lisp is based on lambda calculus. Which I'll get into a little bit more, but um, which is equivalent to a Turing machine. And the problem John McCarthy had was that he thought the Turing machine was really clunky and not very efficient, and that there's a better way of doing it. And that's how Lisp came up. So from the beginning, Lisp was not invented as a programming language. Uh, Lisp was invented as a mathematical notation for computation, for talking about processes, uh, for talking about how thinking works, basically. So it's a logical mathematical notation for computation. So I think that's one of the key things about Lisp. Um, but yeah, what he then thought like, okay, so to show that th this is would be a good Turing machine, um, we need uh, the Lisp function to interpret a Lisp function. Uh, you just had this idea. It's like, yeah. Um, writing eval required inventing a notation representing Lisp functions as Lisp data. And so then he came up with the notation of Lisp for, I for expressing Lisp statements as Lisp programs. Um, so it was just like a thought he had. Um, this was not devised for the purposes of the paper with no thought that it would be used to express Lisp programs in practice. Uh, so he still hasn't said, uh, okay, Lisp is going to be a programming language. This is still mathematical notation. But it's used to express computation in kind of the language he was inventing in, in this Lisp language. But what happened was uh, this guy came along. Uh, so this, yeah, Steve Russell, now I remember the name. <laughs> uh, his nickname is Slug. 
Uh, and he's, he seems like a really fun guy. And yeah, so he's actually still around at the Computer History Museum showing people how computers work. Uh, so he invented the first computer game. Th that was a bit later, but at this time he was a student in the MIT uh, team. So actually, if we go back to uh, the slide I had, uh, that, that, uh, what's that? Yes, uh, this one. Uh, so that's him at the bottom, Steve Russell. So he was in the team. Anyway, he saw kind of this eval function that, uh, that MacArthur had written because his job in the team at the time was to hand compile Lisp code into machine code. So they had the computer that spoke machine code and they had these ideas for representing knowledge in Lisp and he would hand transcribe those into machine code. It's a boring job. Um, he would much rather be playing space war. Um, so <laughs> So he thought, oh, I, I'll, I'll just do this evil function and then that can do my job and I can go back to playing video games. Uh, so uh, <laughs> I've had another quote from Felix Fox, which I thought was a really great quote. Um, so the trick was to keep all the group from playing space war so they would work on the matters at hand. <laughs> so yeah, so the first thing they did was invent the first video game and then they were just wasting time playing video games. So that was pretty fun. Um, so Steve Russell, so this is a quote from John McCarthy. Uh, Steve Russell said, look, why don't I program this eval? And I said to him, oh no, you're confusing theory and practice. This eval is for reading, it's not for computing. Uh, but he did it anyway, which, uh, you know, thank you, Steve Russell. Um, so that brings us to Lisp. Um, so the, the syntax of Lisp is S expressions. Um, S expressions are based on the lambda calculus. So you're going to see the new slides I have are hand-drawn <laughs> like this. Um, uh, kind of a weird mix, but we'll, we'll live with it. Um, so the Lambda Calculus was invented in the 30s um, as a way to represent uh, computation uh, using basically recursive functions. So the idea is that if you have recursive functions, the functions that can uh, call any other function, um, you can express any kind of computation, any kind of process based on that. And so it's basically the same idea as the Turing machine, but whereas the Turing machine is a description of a physical machine, which, although impossible because it involves like an infinite tape and things like that, um, the lambda calculus is a purely mathematical notation. So it's, it's cleaner in that sense. That was the idea of John McCarthy, that this would be a better basis for doing logic and math in about computation than the uh, Turing machine. Um, so kind of the notation of Lisp and some of the terminology comes from lambda notation, among that lambda for representing functions. Um, but yeah, it involves a lot of parentheses. Uh, and this is a quote from the, f the Lisp 1.5 programmer's manual, uh, which shows kind of the problem of the parentheses existed already. Uh, to prevent reading from continuing indefinitely, each package should end with stop, followed by a large number of write parentheses. An unpaired write parentheses would cause a read error and terminate reading. So, you know, probably in your program you're going to have too many parentheses somewhere, you're not going to have it matched, so you just put a bunch of them at the end, they're going to solve everything. <laughs> um, and, and actually this is a quote from Phyllis Fox again. Um, so uh, have you ever seen a page of Lisp? And the interview says, I've done a little Lisp programming. And she says, oh, you have. So she actually, she wasn't aware that Lisp is still around. She thought like this is something I was doing in the 40s uh, or in the 50s. And you know, like these days they have new fancy programming languages. Uh, so she's, she was a bit surprised that people actually use Lisp still. Because um, she said, once parentheses keys wore out, they didn't work after a while. Lisp programs are loaded parentheses. You've done it, I'm impressed. That's not easy writing. So <laughs> um, so yeah, the parentheses is, is kind of the strength and the weakness of Lisp. I'm not going to argue against that. Um, but the cool thing about Lisp is that it's really simple. So the basic Lisp was a sim symbolic programming language. So it didn't have things like numbers or strings or things that we're used to in the programming language. It had two things. You had atoms, which were kind of words. So here I have, uh, yeah, I don't know if you can see that. It's a bit difficult. Uh, so you have foo, that's an atom, ten is an atom, hello world, that's an atom, and then you have lists, and lists are basically parentheses. So uh, two parentheses is the empty list, uh, or nil. Um, parentheses A, B, and C is a list of three elements, three atoms, the atoms A, B, and C. 
And then you can nest these. So you have a list of a list. Uh, so here's a list that contains two elements, where the two elements are lists, and each element has two atoms in it. So A and B and C and D. Um, so taking uh, this, the way to represent that in memory, the usual way, is with linked lists. So I have kind of a drawing of how we represent lists uh, in memory. Thi this is usually the case. So uh, actually, if you're programming closure, which is one of the more modern lists, uh, it's not represented this way. Uh, but for, for the purposes of writing your own, this is the easiest way to start. Uh, so what you have are something called concells and atoms, or values. And the concells are basically two pointers glued together. Um, the first one is uh, pointing to the thing in the position of the list, and the second one is pointing to the next element, next part in of the list. Uh, so here we have uh, a list of a list of one element, and then another element. Uh, so you can see there's uh, one concell where the first cell points to another concept, which it's containing a list, uh, and then the second is pointing to the second element of uh, the list. Uh, I don't know if that makes sense, but uh, that's basically kind of how we represent uh, list structures in memory. Um, and to manipulate lists, there are some basic uh, operations. Uh, and the names of these, are kind of the ideas, come from the IBM 704. Uh, so you have cons, which is to add an element to the front of the list. So basically what you're doing is you're constructing a console. That's why it's called cons. Uh, and you're putting in the first element, you're putting uh, the thing that you want to put in that position in the list. And then as the second argument, you give it the rest of the list. So you're kind of building lists from the back to the front. Uh, so I here we're adding um, A to the front of the empty list, which gives us a list containing A. And then we call cons again, uh, and adding B to the front of that list, and then we get a list of B and A. So building it that way, we're kind of building it backwards. And if you look at kind of basic Lisp code, um, you see a lot of list reversal, because you end up building things backwards and then flipping it over, uh, so you get them in the right order. Um, then you have the operations for actually getting the parts of the list. Uh, and those are called car and kudder. Uh, and these come from two instructions on the IBM 704 called car for contents of the address register and cutter for contents of the decrement register. And uh, the reason for this is that the registers on the IBM 704 were 36 bit wide and they were split into multiple parts. Uh, so you had one part which, which was called a tag, which was a few bytes we could use to identify what's, what's in this register. Uh, and then you had two parts, you could actually fit two pointers into one register. Um, so you have in the car uh, part, you have one pointer, and in the color part, you have another pointer. So this makes it really easy to represent these kind of structures on the IBM 704. So it makes sense why they would use this. Um, but it also makes it kind of confusing when you get the list today and you see these names, but we're living with them. Uh, then I'm also using this notation called quote, where um, because lists are also used to represent functions, you need some way to tell when a list is a list and a list is a function. And the way you do that is you quote the list. So you say, okay, quote this list means don't pretend that it's a function A calling with arguments B and C. It's really a list of A, B, and C. Um, then we need some basic operations. Uh, we need to see if something is a list or an atom. Uh, we need to be able to see if two things are the same. And then we have the cond uh, expression, which is basically if. And actually, um, kind of the if statement hadn't been invented yet. Uh, they were still thinking in machine language, so you have like uh, jump statements, you jump these many instructions forward and backwards, uh, but there's no conditional statements yet. So this was an invention of Lisp. So if you're using if, you're using something invented in Lisp, uh, which is also kind of mind-blowing. Um, yeah, then we also represent function calls as lists. So uh, a function call is just a normal list where you interpret the first element as the function to call. Um, and the way you define a function is using lambda. So you say lambda, and then you give it the argument list, and then you have the body of the function. Uh, so at the bottom here, you can see we do, so I wrote lambda as a lambda, and then I typed it out. Um, um, here we have lambda x and y, add x and y, and then 
we pass two and three to that function, and then we should get five back. Uh, so uh, I haven't shown you a way of actually naming functions yet, but but yeah. Then the key thing with Lisp is recursive functions, which is functions that can call themselves. And the easiest way to do this is to give the function a name, then you can refer to it again. You actually don't have to do that. Uh, there is a way to call anonymous functions recursively, which is mind-blowing as well. I'm not going to go into that. Uh, but yeah, uh, with, with these things, you have everything. So this is basically it. This is Lisp. This is you know all a programming. You can build everything else on top of that, loops, everything. That's all you need. It's pretty, uh, pretty amazing. Uh, here's a quote from Alan Kay, who is the inventor of object-oriented programming. And so, when I finally understood that the half-pacer code on the bottom of page 13 of the Lisp 1.5 manual was Lisp in itself, uh, it was the whole world of programming in a few lines that I could put my hand over. Uh, and it is pretty cool that, you know, if you wonder, like, oh, how do programs work? How do, does programming work in the abstract? Actually, you can express it in very little code. Um, it's it's not that much. You don't you don't need that many primitives to build up uh, programming. Um, and so this is the bottom of page 13 in the Lisp 1.5 manual, and this is the evil functions that uh, John McCarthy was talking about. Unfortunately, it doesn't look like Lisp like we know it today. Uh, this was written in something called M expressions, and that's because. When John McCarthy um, invented S expressions, it was used for kind of notational purposes, and he didn't think anyone would actually want to use them. It would look horrible. There's too many parentheses. So he also invented a programming language called M expressions that were more user friendly, but sadly, no one ever picked that up. <laughs> Everyone just kept using S expressions. Um, but yeah, so kind of the. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, I'm running out of time at the same point again. So. Let me let me just talk. Uh, okay, so if you want to know more about like why I'm interested in Lisp, I have you know like why Lisp and why free software. These are good questions. I go into that in the previous time I did the talk. I just want to show you a little bit of what else I have. I'm gonna have to do this talk again. Um, so yeah, uh, there's a lot of stuff that I have in the time to talk to. So I, I'm still in the 60s at this point. Um, if we get into the 70s, we get some really fascinating people to talk about, some really cool stuff. Scheme is another list I like. It's really awesome. Uh, Guy Steele Jr. might be my favorite human alive. Uh, well, my wife, then Guy Steele. Um, I found Guy Steele's uh, CV online, and it's 57 pages long. And I don't think it's inflated. It's actually, you know, like he's just got the essentials in there. Uh, he's, he's an amazing person. Uh, then in the 80s, we get Common Lisp, which is the other big dialect. And I would say... Common Lisp was death of Lisp. That's why you haven't heard about it so much because yeah, Common Lisp is massive. It's too too many things. It's like death by committee. Not great, my opinion. Um, then in the 2010s we get closure again, so Lisp coming back. Uh, but uh, from Lisp you get stuff like basically every program language you have. So virtual machines, the virtual computing. Um, John McCarthy also invented time sharing when he was developing at the MIT lab. So they had this one computer, but they wanted to do multiple things at once. Uh, he invented cloud computing, you could say. So that's kind of part of this. Um, but the cool thing about Lisp is that it's before that, and kind of the track that most programming languages do, is that they're focused on telling the computer what to do. They're focused on the computer, like the actual machine, and like the specifics of doing things in a certain order. Whereas Lisp focused on computation, the kind of the abstract mathematical notation, something that doesn't really require a computer. Like you could, you could do, you could say like the g ancient Greeks that were inventing algorithms were doing computation, and anyone following a set of instructions is doing computation. And what John McCarthy was doing is trying to formalize this so that he could understand it and then tell a computer how to do it, um, which I think is kind of a cool way to think about it. Um, and that's that's kind of the amazing thing about Lisp. So it's thinking about computation not as like how do I tell the computer what to do, but wha like what is software actually? That's a difficult question. Uh, it's pretty cool. But yeah, I have a few minutes left. I'm going to show you. So I've written my own Lisp interpreter. It's as small as I can get it. It includes a uh, copy and garbage collector uh, and uh, eval from Lisp 1.5, so you can run like simple Lisp 1.5 programs. Um, 
And if you want to see like kind of how how do you write a Lisp in C, you can look at that. So you can do it yourself. It's not that difficult. Um, the basic parts you need is that you need a basic machine model, which is the garbage collector and how to lay out objects in memory, how to do I/O and so on. And then on top of that, you have something called the REPL uh, or the re read eval print loop, which is you read a Lisp statement, uh, you evaluate it, you print the result, and then you loop. And that's basically it. Uh, but in the minutes that I have left, I'm going to show you how to write your own garbage collector because I think this is one of the things that kind of blew my mind that it's actually not that difficult. You can do it. And what I'm going to show you how to write is the uh, non-recursive list compacting algorithm, uh, which is a copying garbage collector. And it's the foundation for every garbage collector in use today, including the garbage collector used in uh, JVM, all of them. Um, any garbage collector that's copying, so there's two categories of garbage collectors. There's the non-copying and the copying garbage collectors. Um, the non-copying ones don't move things around in memory. So if you have a program where you have some code in C and you pass pointers around, you can get the address and stuff, then you can't really move anything because then the addresses get outdated. Uh, but if you can guarantee that no one knows the address of anything, then you can actually move stuff around and you can defragment memory and so on. So that's kind of the better way to do it. And that's how Java works and most garbage collector work. Um, and they all use this garbage collector as one part of the garbage collector algorithm. So uh, I'm going to show you how that works. So basically what we do is we split memory in half. So we're using half of the memory. We, we only use half of memory at any time. Uh, because what we need is another half to move stuff into. Um, so here you can see we have the stack, which is where the functions uh, frames live. Uh, in the stack, we point into the heap memory where the rest of uh, the stuff lives. Um, and so, yeah, so unfortunately, I, I started doing A, B, C, and D, and E, F, G, and stuff there, but then I used F, G because F for function. Is so, it's so the F there is not the same as F there. Ignore that part. Um, but what we have is we have some stack frames pointing into memory, and then we have pointers between stuff in memory. And what we want to do is we want to get all the stuff we want to keep over to the other half and just leave the garbage uh, where it is. Uh, so we do this in two steps. Step one is that we move everything that's pointed to from the stack. So we go through the stack one by one, and when we see uh, an object being pointed to, we move that to the other heap. Um, and in the place of it, we leave kind of a forwarding pointer. That's one of the tricks, is that when then we come across something pointing to that location again, it's going to say, oh, no, you have to go over here to find it. Um, but that's just detail. So what we do is we move those. And then step two is that we start going through the objects in the heap that we moved to in order, and we move the stuff that those things are, are pointing to. Um, and that's it. When we've done that, we're done. That's We've collected the garbage. And the cool thing about that is that we're only going through this the live stuff. We don't have to actually go through the garbage. We just leave the garbage behind. So it's really fast and efficient. Um, so that probably didn't make sense. But uh, yeah, that's how it works. And I actually have all the source code for it right here. Uh, it's not that much. You can see it. It's pretty cool. That's it. That's my talk. Thank you. <laughs>